Good evening, and welcome to the first Rose and Raymond Singh Distinguished Lecture. My name is Randy Hirokawa, and I'm honored to be the moderator for tonight's event. As you can see, we have a sold out audience, so uh, if you have any vacant seat next to you, please um, allow folks to sit next to you so we can get started. First, a few housekeeping announcements. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you, please turn off or silence your cell phones, watch alarms, or anything that rings, buzzes, or beeps. <laughs> please be sure to disable your, the flash on your camera so that it doesn't disturb our speaker tonight. Um, and please be aware that making a video photo or, order, or, or audio recordings of this evening's performance is, is prohibited. The Rose and Raymond Sang Distinguished Lecture Series is an initiative supported by an endowed fund started by Rose Sang, Chancellor Emerita at UH Healer and her husband Raymond Sang. The lecture series in, is intended to continue Hawaii's dialogue with the rest of the world in areas that were important to Rose during her tenure as UH Hilo Chancellor. We are delighted that Rose Sang is with us tonight. Rose? I would now like to call on Interim Chancellor Marcia Sakai to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker. Following the lecture, there will be time for some questions and answers. If you wish to ask a question, Please write your question on the index card that the ushers have, and then pass your cards to your right so that we can collect them. And we will try to ask as many of your questions as we can get to uh, in the amount of time that we have. Chancellor Sakai. Thank you, Randy. Aloha, everyone. Good evening and mahalo for attending the first Rose and Raymond Sang Distinguished Lecture. Tonight, we are incredibly honored to welcome Dr. Jennifer Doudna. Dr. Doudna is an internationally renowned professor of chemistry and molecular and cell biology at UC Berkeley. In 2012, Dr. Doudna and her colleagues rocked the research world by first describing a simple way of editing the DNA of any organism using an RNA-guided protein found in bacteria. This breakthrough technology called CRISPR-Cas9 has redefined the possibilities for human and non-human applications of gene editing, including opening up and accelerating the development of new genetic surgeries to cure disease, novel ways to care for the environment, and nutritious foods for a growing global population challenged by climate change. Dr. Doudna is also the executive director of the Innovative Genomics Institute, an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Inventors, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is also a foreign member of the Royal Society and has received many other honors. She is the co-author of the book, A Crack in Creation, which tells the story of her discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 and passionately cautions us of the enormous responsibility that comes with the ability to rewrite the genetic code of life and possibly control evolution. Dr. Doudna received her BA from Pomona College and her PhD from the Harvard Medical School. Our community is proud to acknowledge that she is a 1981 graduate of Hilo High School
and was recognized as a distinguished Hilo High School alumna in 2017. Her father, Martin Doudna, was a well-respected member of UH Hilo's English faculty, and her mother, Dorothy, taught history at Hawaii Community College. We are so honored to have her back in her hometown of Hilo. Mahalo. And Dr. Doudna. Wow, well, good evening and aloha, everyone. Aloha. It's an incredible uh, pleasure and honor for me to be here. And I, I'd really like to start by thanking the chancellor for that generous introduction. And of course, my host, uh, Randy Hirokawa, who's given me a fantastic uh, time today looking around uh, Hilo town, which has been great. And, uh, and then, of course, I'd, I'd really like to just express my incredible honor to be back here at UHH and in this capacity as the, the inaugural uh, Sang lecturer to honor Rose Sang and her husband Raymond. It's really a, a great uh, pleasure for me to do that. And, uh, and to have the chance to talk to you and, and, and tell you about a little bit about what I've been up to uh, the last few years. And um, you know, I, I am a Hilo girl, so I, you know, I grew up here. My parents moved here in 1971. My dad joined the English faculty here at UHH. And uh, over the years in Hilo, I had the opportunity to work with a number of really special people. And when I think, you know, I, a lot of people ask me now, you know, why did you become a scientist? And um, when I think about the answer to that question, a lot of it has to do with my experience uh, growing up here in Hilo. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit of that uh, during the talk tonight. What I wanted to do is really just to share with you what uh, I've been working on in my lab at Berkeley and what I've been doing with my students over the last uh, roughly 10 years or so that led to an unexpected discovery of you know, the process of doing science and um, trying to ask questions about the fundamental nature of biology and having that project that we started lead in a very unexpected direction. And that's really the story of CRISPR. And, um, and to, to, get, uh, to, to get started with, and talk a little bit about what genome editing is, I think really the, the story of genome editing really begins with the structure of DNA and this beautiful double helix that was figured out back in the 1950s. And I think really at that time, scientists already started to imagine what you could do if you could read the code of life and, re and write that code and eventually rewrite that code? What if you could actually make changes to DNA in cells that would allow understanding the genetics of who we are as humans and the natural world, uh, the, the genetics of all of the organisms that we interact with in our environment, and, uh, and, and uh, also be able to manipulate that code by uh, making precise changes? And of course, at that time, it seemed like really uh, science fiction. But over the years, if we look back you know, at what's happened over the last several decades, there have been a progression of technologies for doing exactly that, namely uh, manipulating DNA in different ways. And what, what the technology tonight uh, that I'll talk about tonight really does is give uh, scientists a really easy tool for making very precise and accurate changes to the DNA in cells, so precise that we can change one letter, one uh, one, uh, one uh, letter in the code of the human entire, entire human genome, if we want to, in three billion uh, base pairs. So it's really in a, kind of an incredible uh, way that we have now in science to manipulate the natural world. So for me, thinking back on you know how did I how did I how did I get where I am? Um, a lot of it started uh, here in Hilo, and you know my dad uh, was an avid uh, uh, reader of used books, and <laughs> and uh, he threw this book on my bed one day when I was probably about 12 or 13 years old, and I read this uh, story of the discovery of, of the structure of DNA, and um, it was one of the things that really got me thinking about the possibility of becoming a scientist. And I actually didn't, I didn't know any, anybody who was a scientist at that time. Nobody in my family was. But I started thinking that it could be a pretty interesting way to spend your life, you know, doing experiments to figure out things that nobody had ever figured out before. And, uh, and then uh, here's a picture of me um, that I dug this out uh, back in... Uh, <laughs> So I dug this out uh, from uh, probably around 1979 or so with my sisters and my best friend, uh, Lisa 
Hinkley at that time, Lisa Twigsmith, who's here tonight, and uh, her dog, Moana. And here we are sitting uh, in our garage. And, you know, we used to go out exploring in our neighborhood. And a lot of the things that I saw around me, the plants and animals that occupied the uh, environment that we have here in Hawaii, kind of sparked my curiosity about how those organisms had evolved to survive and thrive in this very interesting environment. And my dad really encouraged that too. So here's a picture of us uh, down at uh, around four miles, you know, looking for glass balls. And we even found a few, which is kind of cool. Um, and, uh, you know, dad really uh, always encouraged me to, to pursue my curiosity about the natural world, even though he was not a scientist. He was very interested in the process of science. And, uh, and then I had another very important uh, person here at UHH who gave me a chance to think about being a scientist, and that's Don Hemis, um, who's also here tonight with his wife, Helen. Um, and, uh, you know, Don gave me a chance to work in his lab and play with electron microscopes when I, do, I knew absolutely nothing about science, but, you know, he gave me that, that chance, and it showed me that um, you know, that science was an incredibly interesting process. And I still remember working in his lab that summer. And I, I, you know, it was one of those times when I absolutely couldn't get wait to get up in the morning and get to the lab because I really wanted to do the next experiment. And I, that's when I kind of realized that, you know, this is, this is something that I really, you know, I want to figure out how to do this with my life. And so I went off to, um, after I graduated from Yale High School, um, I went off to college, and I went to, uh, went to college, and, you know, I, I was a chemistry major, but I took one class in biology and biochemistry, and we were taught about the, what's called the central dogma of molecular biology, which is that, you know, DNA, uh, which is over here on the left, this beautiful double helical molecule, the code of life, encodes all of the information to make a cell or make an entire organism. And uh, the way it works is that this information is transferred, it's transcribed into molecules of RNA over here uh, in the center, and then ultimately translated into proteins. And the proteins, you know, we were taught that the proteins are the, uh, the real business end of this process. They do all of the interesting things in cells. The DNA is very important because it has the, the, the code uh, that makes the proteins. And then in the middle are these very boring, uninteresting molecules of RNA that are kind of th a throwaway copy of the genome. And, uh, and that's uh, how, I, how I was first introduced to RNA. But uh, after college, I, I went off to graduate school, and I realized, I learned, that, uh, that actually in, in many cases, the RNA molecules that are made in cells do really interesting things in their own right. They have three-dimensional shapes that allow them to do chemistry. And I was studying under a, a, a guy who was thinking about how life got started on the planet. And his theory, along with a few others, was that it was really molecules of RNA that might have originally been capable of storing genetic information, as they do for certain viruses now, and uh, also acting as the, uh, the molecules that could copy that information and replicate those molecules for future uh, sort of primitive cells. And so this was the idea that, you know, our, if we studied how RNA works in modern biology, we might be able to actually learn something about how life got started on the planet Earth in the first place. And so that was a really captivating idea for me as a kind of a budding biochemist. And so I started to study uh, RNA, and I worked on it over the years. And I eventually, uh, after doing some work in Colorado, I, I was hired at Yale University in 94. That was my first faculty job. And, um, and I worked there with a number of people, including Raven Hanna, who's a student, uh, from my, one of my very first grad students. She's actually here tonight. She lives in Pahoa now. And um, Raven. And, uh, and together, you know, with my students in those days, we were, you know, investigating the functions of these RNA molecules. And in a really interesting way, that led me to, to CRISPR and to genome editing, because it turns out that um, uh, as the years advanced, and I en ended up getting recruited away from Yale to the University of California, Berkeley, uh, which I was very excited to do because I, I'm, really a, I'm really a big believer in public education, and you know, I was really happy to join a public university like this one, you know, where you reach out and make uh, education available to anyone, everyone who wants to come and, and, and study and work hard, you know, the, we, the idea is that we make that education available and affordable uh, to them. And so that was a big draw for me to move to the University of California. And when I got there, I started working 
on a project that was aimed at something that sounds very obscure, namely trying to understand how viruses, uh, uh, how a bacteria fight viral infection. And this is a picture showing a surface of a bacterial cell that has viral particles landing on it. And these are actually injecting their DNA uh, into the cell. And so this happens in, in us, of course. We can get infected by viruses, and, and basically most organisms have viruses that can infect them. And so cells have to evolve ways of fighting uh, these guys off. And so we were working on a project to understand uh, how this process works in bacteria. And this led to um, a very, in, in sort of a very unexpected direction. And that's really wanna, what I want to tell you about now. So. Uh, so when I moved to Berkeley, I met a, a gal named Jill Banfield, who is a professor in geobiology. So her lab studies the bacteria that inhabit our environment. And she goes out and does really cool kind of field work where they collect samples of bacteria and then sequence all the DNA in those samples to figure out what's living there and, importantly, what kinds of viruses are interacting with those single-celled organisms. And in the course of her research, she came across a very interesting and kind of mysterious discovery. And that was that many bacteria, so this is a cartoon that shows you the, um, this is a, a, a black line that represents the circular chromosome of a bacterium, the DNA in the bacterium. And she found that in many bacterial uh, chromosomes, you could find a sequence of letters in the DNA code that had a very distinctive pattern. It had a series of repeat elements. These were 30 to 40 uh, letters or base pairs in length, shown by the black diamonds, that flanked unique sequences shown by these colored boxes. And, and so this was a, something that you could easily see in DNA sequencing data. Lots of bacteria seem to have these things. And furthermore, they seem to have uh, genes that were co-varying with these, these arrays, which had come to be called CRISPRs, which stands for Clusters of Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And don't make me ask to say that again. <laughs> but, that, but this is really, um, you know, essentially just a sequence signature that um, was really uh, recognizable and yet had no known function. And so she literally called me up one day in my office at Berkeley and said, you know, I don't really know you, but um, I, you know, I have made this really interesting observation and I think that RNA molecules might be involved in some way. And why did she think that? Well, because what had happened was that in 2005, there were three uh, scientific research groups that noticed that these pieces of sequence that were inserted between the repeated elements in these CRISPR arrays were sequences that matched exactly the sequences of viruses that infect these bacteria. And so it, was, it led to an interesting hypothesis that maybe these CRISPR arrays were in fact a storage mechanism, a kind of a, almost like a genetic vaccination card, where cells that were infected with a virus could somehow store a piece of viral DNA in these CRISPR arrays and then, you know, save it for a rainy day, save it to protect the cell from future infection. And Jill Banfield wondered if that protection mechanism might involve an RNA intermediary. So that's where, that's kind of how I got involved in this. And, and just to show you uh, what we now understand about the way these CRISPR pathways operate, I just wanted to show you a, a little cartoon that illustrates the way this system works. And it's really interesting because it's a, an adaptive immune system that operates in bacteria. And what we now understand from lots of labs that have researched this and looked at um, genetics and biochemistry of how these CRISPR uh, sequences operate is that if a bacterium, so here I'm showing you a cartoon of a, this, this uh, membrane of a bacterial cell, and here's a virus landing on the surface. It's got its DNA packaged in the viral head, and it's injecting uh, the DNA into the cell. And if this cell has a CRISPR sequence in the genome, then it has a way to integrate pieces of the viral DNA into the array, and it maintains that perfect structure of the array with these repeats that flank the inserted sequences. And then um, in the next step, it, um, the cell is able to make a, a copy of this uh, sequence in the form of molecules of RNA. So these are single-stranded copies of the DNA sequence. And uh, interestingly, they have the ability to fold back like little lollipops, and this is, these provide handles for proteins that are encoded in these associated genes 
that can recognize these RNA molecules, chop them into unit-sized pieces that each include one of the pieces of sequence coming from a virus, and then uh, interact with them chemically to form protein RNA complexes. And the cool thing here is that each of these proteins has an RNA molecule that has a sequence derived from the virus that's contained within this, uh, this chemical complex. And that's important because that allows these protein RNA complexes to search through the cell looking for a matching sequence of DNA. When the match is found, that recruits the protein to this DNA, which uh, if, it, if it's uh, coming from a virus, then this is, of course, a DNA the cell would like to destroy. And these proteins can then cut up uh, that foreign DNA. So it's a really nice way that cells can acquire immunity to, to viruses and then use that to protect the cells from future infection. And so we started researching this about 10 years ago in the sort of mid-2000s. And, um, you know, my lab is always a lab that we've always sort of asked the how questions in science. You know, we sort of tend to ask how do things work? How does, you know, so we sort of looked at this pathway and said, wow, that's really cool, but how? How does that work? And so we started studying the function of individual proteins that are encoded by these Cas genes and how they could, you know, interact with RNA and then, you know, find uh, these matching DNA sequences in cells and then how they could cut the DNA once they got there. And one of the things that uh, was really interesting uh, and kind of emerged early on was that there are many different varieties of these CRISPR immune systems in different kinds of bacteria. And this is a, a slide that was taken from a, a review article that was published a couple of years ago that shows that uh, if you look at different kinds of bacteria, you can, you can identify different types of these CRISPR systems. And the way they're classified is by looking at the numbers and types of genes that are found next to the CRISPR arrays in those bugs. And what you might notice here is just that um, you can roughly divide these into two classes, the class one systems that encode uh, multiple different Cas proteins that are required for bacterial uh, immunity. And then down here in the class two systems, in each case, a single large uh, gene that was uh, found to be required for adaptive immunity in these bugs. And um, we got interested in initially in studying these uh, these class one systems because they were they were really fun to to work with because you could you know you could show that all of these different proteins had to assemble into a, a really intricate complex with RNA and they had to have the, they had the ability to look through cells finding matching pieces of DNA and so my lab did spent a few years working on these systems and then as happens in science we got invited or I got invited to a conference in Puerto Rico in 2011 11, where I met uh, a scientist uh, named Emmanuel Charpentier, who was working in seemingly a very different uh, area of science for me. She was doing working on medical microbiology and the kinds of bacteria that infect us humans. And she had stumbled across a different kind of CRISPR system, namely one of these class two systems, that had a gene uh, that was known as Cas9 in the genome that was uh, implicated in protecting bacteria that have this type of CRISPR system uh, protecting them from phage. And so when Emmanuel Charpentier and I met at this conference, we decided to put our complementary types of expertise together in a collaborative project to understand the function of this gene, CRISPR-Cas9. And that was a really uh, kind of, a, in retrospect, a really fateful decision to work with her because we ended up uh, collaborating across you know, thousands of miles. Her lab was in Sweden at the time, and my lab was in Berkeley. So you know, we're in different time zones and uh, different languages, and our, our students were you know, spread out across the globe, and uh, partly through social media and some interesting cultural um, uh, similarities between people in our, working in our laboratories, we were able to answer this uh, question. And what, what, what emerged was that Cas9 is a fascinating protein that has the ability to recognize and open up uh, the DNA double helix and allow two catalytic centers, two molecular blades in the, in the protein to cut these strands of DNA, to make a clean double-stranded break in DNA. And the really important thing about the way this protein works is that it uses an RNA guide that comes from the CRISPR array in the bacterium with 20 letters that are right here that match the letters of DNA 
that uh, basically tells the Cas9 protein where to cut, where to cut the DNA. And there were some other cool details about this that we figured out in the course of uh, doing some biochemical experiments. So we found out that this protein is a, uh, actually uses, it's a dual uh, RNA-guided protein. It uses the RNA from the CRISPR array, but it also uses a second kind of RNA called tracer that forms a structural handle for assembly with Cas9. It's how Cas9 protein knows that this is the right uh, piece of RNA, two RNA molecules to hold on to. And, uh, and then it also is, has this interesting ability to open up the, the double helix, and I'm gonna, I'll say a little bit about, more about that shortly. And so uh, a uh, postdoctoral associate in my lab, Martin Jinek, was uh, doing this research together with Christoph Shailinsky, a graduate student in Emmanuel's lab, and these two guys figured out that uh, they could actually simplify this system compared to what nature had done by combining these two molecules of RNA into what we call a single guide form of the RNA. So we made a chemical connection between these RNA molecules, so now it's a single piece of RNA, and includes the address label here on one end that was easy, something you could easily change in the laboratory to any desired uh, sequence of letters, and then on the other hand, uh, and remained uh, constant. So this provides the structural handle for binding to Cas9. And when Martin Janek in my lab did this experiment and showed me the results and showed me that you, know, you could change this piece of RNA to, on this end, to any desired sequence, and you could basically program Cas9 protein to identify a sequence of DNA and make a cut at any desired sequence that we could decide on in the lab by sim simply changing the 20 letters on this end of the RNA. I think for us, that was, you know, that's one of those moments I'll never forget in my life because, you know, I really felt sort of chills going down my neck thinking this is going to be an incredible tool for working with DNA because it's a way that bacteria have evolved to fight viruses, but scientists can now harness this to do something very different, namely genome editing. And you might be thinking, for, for those of you that are not, not scientists, you might be thinking, well, what's the connection between a, a protein that can be programmed to cut DNA? You gotta admit that's kinda cool, right? But what's the connection between that and triggering a change to the code of life in any kind of cell? And the connection is that while we were doing this research, um, lots of other labs around the world were studying something seemingly different but turned out to be related, which is they were studying how, how cells repair double-stranded DNA breaks. And it turns out that when, uh, when our cells or uh, plant cells, basically any kind of plant or animal cell, when it experiences a double-stranded break to the DNA, something that happens routinely uh, due to all kinds of things, and it happens sort of normally during cell division, and it happens due to exposure to radiation or chemicals, so cells have to be able to repair those breaks. When that happens, so here's a, a break uh, that's happened in a segment of DNA, and if we imagine that's happening in a chromosome in a cell, the cell has machinery to recognize the break and quickly fix it. And in the process of fixing it, the cell can introduce a, a small change to the DNA sequence during the process of repair, or it can actually insert a new piece of DNA at the site of, of the break, and that actually introduces new genetic information into the cell, and it does it precisely. It does it exactly where the DNA was cut in the first place. And just to show you uh, how we imagine that this works in eukaryotic cells, I wanna show you a video that was made for us by a wonderful artist, uh, Janet Owasa, at the University of Utah. She made this um, movie for us. It shows zooming, we're zooming into a eukaryotic cell, so the DNA is inside the nucleus, and you can see the blue DNA, it's wound up, it's packaged very tightly, it's wound around these uh, green proteins, histone proteins, and amazingly, this Cas9 enzyme with its guide RNA is able to search through all of that DNA that's highly packaged to find a sequence that matches the sequence of the guide uh, RNA, that 20 letter stretch. When that occurs, it unwinds the DNA, it forms an RNA uh, hybrid, cuts the double strands of the DNA, and then hands those broken ends off to the repair enzymes in the cell that take over and uh, fix the break, like in this example where it's actually inserting a new piece of genetic information in the process. And amazingly, this 
bacterial enzyme turns out to work very well to trigger this kind of DNA repair in essentially every type of cell and organism where it's been tested. And so, um, you know, this, this sort of um, uh, launched our lab on a fascinating new journey. So this, we published this work back in 2012. And, uh, you know, we could immediately see that this would be a really exciting technology if it worked well. And so we started doing research that we'd really never done in the lab before, which was working with uh, cultured, you know, human cells that we could grow in a dish in the lab and asking whether we could use this technology to trigger precise changes to those cells. And the answer was yes. And of course, many other labs read our paper and started doing those experiments too. And very quickly, within a, just a few months, it was found that you could change the DNA not only in human cells, but you could do it in plants, you could do it in fungi, you could do it in uh, fish, you know, all kinds of animals. And it, it just, scientists uh, began to realize that this was going to be an incredible tool that we now have to control the code of life and really be able to control the way that organisms are, are uh, the way we work with them in the laboratories, so, you know, research opportunities, but also starting to imagine ways that we could do things like cure genetic diseases that we know about, and things like that, really incredible things. And so in my own lab, you know, we've, um, we've continued to, over the last few years, you know, we, again, we, we always tend to ask the how question. So we immediately want to know, well, how does that work? It's sort of an amazing thing. How does this enzyme sift through all that DNA and does it do it right every time or does it ever make mistakes and what controls its activity and how does it, you know, how does it do that? And so, you know, we've been continuing to under, you know, sort of ask this question of, you know, how does it really recognize DNA? And one of the amazing things about the Cas9 uh, protein is that it's able to pry apart those two strands of the DNA double helix at exactly the place that matches this uh, um, address code in the guide RNA by a mechanism that we still don't really fully understand, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, how we think it works. And what I wanna show you here is this is actually a, a 3D printed model of the Cas9 proteins. I have this sitting in my office at Berkeley, and believe it or not, when I'm there in Berkeley and working with my students in my lab, I use this almost every day. And the reason is that um, it, it's a really, uh, you know, it's about sort of yay big, and it's a, a way that I can look at the structure of this molecule. It's based on real X-ray crystallographic data. And uh, we can see how the protein, which is the white uh, part of this structure, holds on to the guide RNA, the orange molecule, and grabs on to a DNA molecule to form an RNA-DNA helix inside the protein. So that's really the mechanism of, of recognition. And when that happens, this other strand of the DNA is melted apart, and the protein then has two chemical cleavers that can swing into position and cut the DNA. And there's lots of really interesting things that we've learned about what triggers that DNA unwinding and, um, and what controls the accuracy of the enzyme. And I just want to mention that one of the things that was kind of, a, has been a mystery, you know, for a long time and kind of still is, is the fact that, you know, Cas9 is uh, somehow able to open up the DNA without an external energy source. So lots of enzymes that have been studied in biology whose job is to interact with DNA, they uh, work by hydrolyzing molecules called ATP or GTP. So they use the chemical energy of breaking bonds to actually uh, open up the DNA helix. And this enzyme doesn't do that, so it doesn't have any external energy source. So we're just scratching our heads wondering, well, where does the energy come from to melt apart the strands of DNA? And uh, one of the clues that's, uh, that uh, has come along about how this might work is that we figured out that this protein undergoes a very large structural rearrangement when it assembles with RNA and DNA. And we think that has something to do with the way it can melt apart the DNA strands. And I just wanted to show you this little movie here. So that molecule is the structure of Cas9 by itself. And you just saw it morphing to the structure that it forms when it binds to the guide RNA, that orange uh, molecule. So a big rearrangement of the protein. And now it's sort of ready to uh, interact with DNA. And when it binds to a matching sequence of DNA, there's an additional change in the protein structure to accommodate that protein, uh, that uh, RNA-DNA hybrid that forms inside the protein. And then finally, 
uh, if the DNA sequence matches the sequence of RNA in the protein, then this chemical cleaver swings into position so they can actually cut uh, the targeted DNA strand. So, you know, and there's lots of data now that support this model for how the protein works. It undergoes this big structural change. Probably that's part of the mechanism of prying apart those DNA strands and also the way that it senses um, its interaction with the correct uh, sequence of DNA, which then triggers DNA cutting. And we've, you know, the, my lab, we've had sort of a long-standing uh, interest in using what we call structural biology to study molecules like this. And so we, you know, we use techniques including X-ray crystallography and electron microscopy, kind of harking back to my uh, days with Don Hemmist, maybe. And, um, you know, um, this is a, a picture of the Cas9 protein holding on to its guide RNA, again, the orange molecule, and um, a double-stranded uh, piece of DNA. And this, you know, when we were able to trap the enzyme on its uh, double-stranded DNA substrate, this revealed a lot of information about how the protein is able to do that and what triggers the cutting uh, of DNA. And this is very important because this is the way that genome editing gets started, is by making an accurate cut in DNA, which then triggers the cell to repair the DNA by making a change to the DNA sequence. And I briefly wanted to just mention to you that, you know, you might wonder, well, um, you know, you did that a few years ago, what are you doing in your lab today? And I wanted to mention a couple of things. So one of the things we're interested in is, you know, we want to understand whether there are new kinds of CRISPR systems in, in bacteria, and also how these uh, enzymes can be employed. And, and, and in, the, in the remaining time, I just wanted to share with you some of the things that are going on, not only in my lab, but in now many laboratories, to think about how we uncover new uh, enzymes and think about how we might use them as technologies, but also how we can employ these enzymes as uh, tools for doing really interesting things, including curing genetic disease, we hope, at some point, and also um, um, you know, studying really fundamental questions in biology. So in our own lab, you know, we've been continuing to work with Jill Banfield, and uh, last year we published a paper that showed that if you examine the phylogeny of bacteria and sort of look at all the DNA sequences that are coming out of the incredible data that labs like hers are generating for the different microbes that inhabit our natural world, um, you can indeed find new examples of proteins that are really different from the Cas9 protein, and yet they're also working as RNA-guided uh, DNA-cutting enzymes. And we found, too, that we called CasX and CasY, and very recently we've been working on how this one uh, called CasX is able to, to function. And um, this is, turns out to be a, an interesting protein. It's quite a bit smaller in terms of the number of amino acids in this protein than what we found for Cas9. So it's a kind of a compact version of, of Cas9, if you will. And um, we were recently able to solve molecular structures of this protein. And what we found was that this is an enzyme that it's quite a bit smaller. So the protein part of it is, is shown uh, up here at top. And you might notice it sort of has a little bit of a lollipop uh, shape to it. So this part that I'm pointing to here is the RNA. So it has a really big uh, component that is made up of RNA. So it has a lot more RNA in it than what we have seen for any other uh, enzyme like this, which is uh, sort of interesting. We don't really know yet what it means uh, in terms of evolution, but it has in different chemical properties that might lend themselves to delivery into certain kinds of cells for genome editing, for example. And it also works really well for genome editing. And here's, I'm just showing you one example. This is the kind of experiment that we'll do we often do in the lab to test uh, genome editing functions. And this is showing you bacteria that are growing on a, on a plate and they're expressing two dye molecules, a red one and a green one. And when those two dyes are expressed together, the cells look yellow. So that's what you see here. And then when we turn on the expression of this CasX protein, now and it's got a guide RNA that's targeting the, um, the, the uh, component of these dyes that turns the cells yellow, we turn that off and we're now able to um, uh, see that the cells are only producing the red protein. So now the cells look red. And you can see that they, you know, they all change, right? So they, it's a very efficient uh, enzyme. It's able to really cleanly target that one gene and turn it off. And so, you know, as, as this technology has developed over the last six years, you know, people are asking themselves, well, what, what's it going to take to turn this into a, you know, from being a kind of a cool 
thing that we do in the lab and we use for research, how can we turn it into a really robust technology that's going to be able to do really important things like, you know, cure genetic diseases someday maybe. And um, so when I think about that, I really come down to three fundamental things that I think are really important. One is delivery. So thinking about how we're going to be able to deliver genome editing molecules into certain kinds of cells or tissues, especially if we wanted to be able to do that in a patient uh, and do it safely. And secondly, how we control the DNA repair that happens after the DNA is cut. And then finally, how we're going to be able to ensure uh, what I call responsible progress. So this is a really powerful tool, and it's widely available. One of the things that makes it a terrific technology is that it's not expensive. It's not difficult to use. So anybody with a little bit of training in molecular biology can do this. We've had high school students come to our lab at Berkeley in the summer for research projects, and within a few weeks, we have them editing human cells that are grown in the lab with this. So it's, you know, it's, it's something that anybody who wants to start using it can do, which is exciting, but it's a little bit scary, too, because it does open the door to a lot of possibilities, right? And you can clearly, you clearly get that. And, um, and so, you know, what's happened over the last six years is truly remarkable. So labs around the world began using CRISPR-Cas9 for gene editing. And what's happened is that, you know, it's been possible to manipulate the DNA in many different kinds of cells and organisms. And for a while, this was a slide that a, a former student, Megan Hochstrasser, in my lab uh, made because, you know, we were sort of, in, you know, really excited. We'd read the scientific literature every week and we'd see, you know, oh, is your, here's a new uh, organism, you know, and every week there was something new. And so she put this slide together and eventually we just, you know, <laughs> were overwhelmed. There's so many, many different things. But it really just gives you the sense that, you know, it's possible to now to, we can manipulate the DNA and insects and different kinds of plants and really any, any type of cell, and of course also in embryos, and I'll, I'll come back to that here in a couple minutes. And, uh, you know, there's lots of applications that people are thinking about involving uh, both fundamental research but also applications in healthcare, therapeutics, agriculture, and diagnostics. And I wanted to mention a few things to you just to get, you know, give, give you a sense of the breadth of science that's now going on, given that this technology is out there, it's out, out and available to use. So this was a slide that a student uh, at, at New York University gave to me at one point, um, because he was working on butterflies and you know studying butterfly wing patterns. And until gene editing, uh, or an easy way to do gene editing came along, it was very hard to really do much more than observe these animals. And you know they would collect these uh, animals in the wild and try to, you know, study their wing patterns, but they couldn't really get at the fundamental genetics of what was controlling the, both the, the wing patterns and also the coloration and, and size of these animals. And with CRISPR-Cas9, it, it suddenly became possible to do that. And so for him, it was, you know, just sort of blew the door off his PhD thesis project. He suddenly had a project. He could, you know, he could get in there and study the genetics of these animals. And this has happened in many uh, different areas of biology where it's now possible to manipulate genetically organisms that very recently were not uh, manipulatable. Um, this was a slide, this is an uh, image that, so this was actually a, uh, an article that came out in The Guardian uh, not too long ago. Uh, for, but I, I like the image because it, um, it sort of highlights the potential of doing something that, again, seems really fantastical, like almost science fiction-y, but now it's, it's actually happening. And that is research going on by Svante Pavo's lab. So you, you may know his name. He, he's the person that is really well known for sequencing the DNA of Neanderthals, right? And kind of an incredible feat. And there's something that's happened in biology over the last few years is that we've had the ability to sequence Neanderthal DNA and other kinds of hominids and primates. And so we're starting to get a much better sense at a molecular level of how we, as homo sapiens, how do we relate to other primates and, 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 and certainly to also to Neanderthals? And, you know, we all had, turns out we all probably have Neanderthal DNA in our, in our genomes, which is uh, really interesting. And one of the questions that their lab wants to understand is what might be the difference genetically in the development of the brain in Neanderthals versus humans? So how could you ever do that, right? I mean, we don't have, you know, Neanderthals are are extinct, but it turns out that from looking at the DNA sequence of Neanderthal DNA, it was possible to 
identify genes uniquely in Neanderthals that uh, are hypothesized to affect the development of neurons. And so using uh, organoids, which are little brain pieces of sort of brain tissue that you can culture in the lab, it's using, they're using CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce those Neanderthal genes into uh, the human genome and ask how does that affect the development of these, these brain organoids. And, you know, just, I don't know what the results will be, but it's a, you know, it's a fascinating sort of example of what's being done on the research front using this technology. In healthcare, um, you know, besides sort of the, some of the obvious things of, of being able to, you know, thinking about uh, curing genetic disease, this is a uh, work that's going on in both academic and uh, commercial labs where they are modifying pigs to be potentially better organ donors for humans by removing viruses that are part of the, sort of naturally part of the pig genome and also introducing, uh, introducing genes into the pig genome that make their organs more human-like so they won't be rejected uh, when they're used for organ donation. And I, I thought I would, this is one little, little uh, tidbit from, from our own lab. So we've been working over the last few years with a team of uh, clinicians at UCSF, which is our medical school across the bay from Berkeley. And I met, I met some colleagues there who are experts in brain cancer, glioblastoma, which, as you know, is a, really a devastating uh, disease. And we've been thinking about how we could use gene editing ultimately to um, try to ameliorate that disease, potentially even trigger an immune response to, uh, to, to brain tumors. And the first uh, thing we had to think about was, well, if you wanted to do that, how would you get the gene editing molecules into the brain in the first place? And so this was work that was done by Brett Stahl, a, a postdoctoral associate in the lab, uh, who's been making chemical modifications to the Cas9 protein and its guide RNA so that we can inject these modified molecules into the brain. And we're doing this in, uh, this is a mouse uh, brain that you're looking at here, a cartoon. And so we inject these molecules in and they've been modified so they can actually cross the cell membrane and get into neurons and edit the DNA of those neurons. And um, you can maybe see it over here, hopefully, but um, this is a slice out of a a mouse brain where we've done these injections on two sides where you can see a large volume of tissue that gets edited and we know these cells are edited because they are, uh, they, they're engineered so that they turn red when the precise uh, editing that we're, we're trying to trigger actually happens in those cells. And we're excited about this because we think that this is a way that we can actually ultimately deliver these molecules into uh, potentially into patient brains. And the nice thing about a treatment like this is that it's a one and done kind of treatment because the cells get edited and then their DNA is, is permanently uh, altered. In agriculture, you know, lots of things going on. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll, we'll discuss it a little bit uh, at the end of this. But I just wanted to point out that I think the opportunities here are really huge. And this was a paper that was uh, published by a colleague of mine at Cold Spring Harbor Lab, Zach Lipman last summer that really uh, kind of created a ripple. And I, you know, I was just at a conference in New York about 10 days ago, and I saw him give a talk. And it was really, it was electrifying. It really was. It was just electrifying. Because he's showing us that you can use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 for gene editing in all sorts of crops. And this is, he was doing this uh, work in tomatoes, where they were able to engineer tomatoes very precisely, make one change to one gene in the genome, no, no uh, changes anywhere else that um, allows these, these uh, plants to branch much more, uh, much more extensively. And so you get two to three-fold higher crop yields on, on these plants. And um, you know, something that you know, took him a few weeks to do with this technology. And if you did it with traditional plant breeding, it would take you know, easily years and might be very, very hard to even get uh, this change to occur in the first place. So it just you know, shows you what's going to be happening in the future as more and more um, plant biologists get their hands on this and start using it in, in different uh, kinds of plants. And then finally, very recently, there's been uh, development of different kinds of CRISPR-Cas proteins. The, this is a protein called Cas12 that allow use of these, uh, these uh, proteins for uh, diagnostics. And um, I'm really excited about this because it, it opens, a, opens the door to doing all kinds of uh, detection of things like viruses and bacteria, even uh, screening for mutations in DNA that lead to cancer, and doing it in a doctor's office, doing it or potentially even doing it uh, ultimately in a, the kind of you know, uh, kit you could buy at a drugstore and uh, have a real-time test that tells you something about something very important about either your DNA or the DNA of something that might be infecting you. So you know, we're really excited about the opportunities there as well. 
Now, I just wanted to, to end by, um, by pointing out that, you know, we've been talking mostly about uh, somatic cell editing, at least with respect to, to therapeutics in humans up until now. And um, there's a, a different kind of editing that can be done called germ cell editing. And this, you know, the difference here is that somatic cell editing means making changes to DNA that's not heritable. So you're making changes to cells that are already permanently uh, differentiated. They're not going to um, be uh, creating a new person. But if you do this kind of editing in germ cells, then these changes to DNA are heritable, and they can be passed on to future generations. And um, very early on in this technology, it was clear that you could do uh, you could do germline editing easily in animals. So within just a few months of our or original publication, there were labs already doing germline editing in rats and, uh, and, and mice, for example, in laboratory experiments. And so already I started thinking, gosh, if it was that easy in mice and rats, maybe you could do that in human embryos. And of course, many other people started to think about that too. And um, and in fact, uh, this was actually a, a picture that was published on the cover of The Economist magazine uh, about three years ago under the banner Editing Humanity. And there was a whole article, and if you followed this, there was a follow-up issue of The Economist on the same topic where they talked about, you know, gee, what if you could use gene editing to, you know, uh, make various kinds of interesting enhancements to kids, you know, and would this be something we should do? And, um, you know, it raises some really important and profound questions. And, um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot, and, and this really got me involved in a lot of the sort of the ethical discussions that are currently going on uh, around the world, including a report that was published recently on uh, the potential for human uh, genome editing. This was published by the National Academies here in the U.S., in China, and the United Kingdom. And we're holding another meeting in Hong Kong, uh, in November to discuss the same topic because the field continues to advance very quickly and there's actually now quite a lot of research going on in human embryos and you can sort of see where that's, uh, you know, going, at least in the short term, you know, it's really progressing towards the possibility of really using this in a, in a clinical sense. So um, it's a, you know, it's a really interesting and, uh, you know, profound sort of moment that we're in where we have this incredible technology. It's really exciting for scientists, but we also have to really ask ourselves, you know, what is the responsible way to use this going forward? So I'm just going to, I'm going to close there and, you know, really just um, point out that, you know, gene editing and, and sort of this idea of RNA guided uh, gene editing, very powerful technology for manipulating genomes. And there's lots of different flavors of this now, different ways of doing it, different uh, enzymes. So this, this differences in the details, but fundamentally, it's really changed the way that we're doing uh, work in biology these days. And, uh, you know, the applications are going to depend on delivery and, of course, control. And by control, I mean both chemical control, but also societal uh, control. And then finally, that you know, the ongoing work in CRISPR biology is going to continue to drive the field forward and uncover new ways of using these proteins and probably new technologies that will come along as well. Uh, all of this is done with an incredible team of scientists. So one of the things I love the most about science, actually, is the people that I've had the pleasure to work with. And, you know, I have a truly international lab at Berkeley. You know, people come from all over the world uh, to work in the lab. And here's a snapshot that we took recently of the group. And these include uh, undergraduate students, graduate students, postdoctoral scientists and technicians. And occasionally we have sabbatical uh, scientists that come. So it's a really fun place to be with very, I have a, you know, good fortune to work with some really, really smart, really exciting people. We collaborate a lot with uh, scientists, so I'm just giving you a snapshot of some of the uh, folks that we're working on, uh, working with uh, down here. Many of them are at my home institution, but we occasionally work with people elsewhere, like Emmanuel. And then finally, we couldn't do anything without funding. And one of the challenges of running a, a research lab is that, you know, we're always sort of scraping and scrambling for money. And uh, I just want to point out that I, I'm incredibly grateful to organizations that, you know, supported my lab back when we were just starting to think about CRISPR biology and, you know, sort of that seemed like a really wacky thing to work on, but, you know, we had the support of especially the National Science Foundation and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in those days, um, and I'm just, I'll be eternally grateful that they gave us a shot at something that, you know, started off very, very small and turned into something truly unexpected. So, thank you very much.
Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. So if you have any questions for her, write your question on the index card and pass it over, and then we'll try to get uh, as many questions as we can. But Jennifer said, I can ask the first question. <laughs> so that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a tremendous honor. So um, <laughs> let me ask the first question. So in listening to your talk tonight, I'm going to ask you to be a fortune teller, foreseer of the future. Okay. So let's say in the next five years, what do you foresee as two or three of the major breakthroughs in genetics that you really feel are going to happen as the result of the use of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. What do you, what's your best guess on the two or three most profound breakthroughs that are going to happen in the next five years? Well, um, so I'm probably totally wrong about this, but I'll guess anyway. Um, I, think, I think one is likely to be a cure for sickle cell anemia. So you may know that that's a blood disease. Uh, it has a well-known genetic cause that has been actually known for you know, a couple of decades. And, um, and we now have a tool to correct that, that mutation. So I think that's uh, a disease that is a, probably going to be an early target uh, for use of this technology clinically because it's possible to remove blood cells from a patient, do the correction outside the body, and then put the cells back. So it avoids this whole issue of delivery because you can do it in a test tube effectively. So that's one. I think that, um, you know, I, sh I showed that one slide about the tomatoes, and I actually think that um, probably the nearest term applications of CRISPR-Cas9 are likely to be in agriculture, and we're going to see a big ramp up in, in this, I think, in the, in the coming two or three years. There already are something like 25 commercial products that are coming through the pipeline at different companies using CRISPR-Cas9 to make targeted changes to plant genomes. I think that's going to be another one. And, um, you know, and I think that also the possibility of, on the research side of really uncovering the genetics of certain kinds of diseases, understanding things like, you know, like you might wonder, you know, why is it that when you have a family of people, some of them uh, are susceptible or succumb to certain, uh, you know, genetically linked diseases, but others don't. And yet they all, if you looked in the genome, they all have, they might all have the same uh, genes. And so why is that? And so I think really trying to understand the more complex aspects of certain genetic disorders, I think that's coming with this technology as well. Okay, what advice would you give a high school student considering pursuing a career in the sciences? Uh, my, my advice would be, first of all, go for it. <laughs> it's a great career. Um, and, and, and really, it's, it's kind of about don't, don't let anyone dissuade you. Because, you know, I can think of many times, actually, in my uh, my life, my career, where I felt discouraged, I was frustrated, you know, this, this might give you the sense that everything worked the first time, and that's absolutely not true. You know, there are lots of things that didn't work and were very frustrating, and, you know, times when I thought, gosh, I don't really think I have it in me to, to continue. And fortunately for me, whenever those, those times uh, happened, I had the good fortune to run into somebody, and some of them are sitting here in this audience, who, uh, you know, who um, uh, shored up my confidence. And so look for people like that, that you can reach out to, who are going to tell you, you know, go for it, you can do it. And, and the answer is you can. You know, you can. You can do it. Okay, this evidently must have come from a scientist. <laughs> Since mitochondrial DNA from the mother is the same in her offspring, will CRISPR be used to change mitochondrial DNA to prohibit genetic diseases passed down from, by the mit mit mitochondrial DNA? Right, so that, that is, that's a great question. And um, the challenge there, so just to... to you know, put that a little bit in context. So, um, you know, in, in eukaryotic cells, we've got a nucleus with DNA in there, and then we've also got mitochondria, which are these organelles that also have their own DNA. Very interesting. And they're the kind of the powerhouse, the energy powerhouses of, of the cell, so they're important for energy production. 
And uh, there's a number of genetically uh, cause, you know, diseases that are, have genetic basis that are caused by mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. So a lot of people have been thinking about, you know, could you actually use gene editing to change those uh, mutations in mitochondrial DNA? And I, I think a big challenge to that, it's, it's, I think it's in principle as possible, but the big challenge there is that cells have many mitochondria, right? Each cell has many. So if you wanted to correct a, a mutation in mitochondrial DNA, you'd have to somehow ensure that you got the editor into all of the mitochondria of a cell. And it's kind of, you know, at least for now, I think that's technically a little beyond where, where we are. It's not to say that one couldn't do it ever, but I think right now that's going to be hard. Okay, I was anticipating this question. <laughs> do you have any comments regarding the recent patent CRISPR court findings? Yeah, so, you know, this question always comes up about patents. And, you know, one of, one of the things that I, I've uh, uh, sort of had to learn, I'm still learning it over the last few years, is, um, you know, a little bit about our patent system here in the U.S. and also internationally. So, you know, patents are, why do people file patents? Well, they file patents because, in principle at least, the idea is to protect technology so that companies that want to commercialize it have some... Uh, some protection while they develop a technology that's going to take maybe a very long time to come to fruition, especially true if you're doing human therapeutics where it might take 10 or more years to create a drug and you'd, you don't want to you know, have the drug created and then have lots of other competitors be able to just immediately uh, capitalize on that. You want to have protection for the company. Um, but as a result, you know, the, it's, it's become a very complicated thing for technologies like this that are effectively, you know, tools. They're really platforms that you can use in many different contexts. And so, you know, the University of California filed uh, patents around CRISPR-Cas9, but of course other people did too, including MIT and the Broad Institute. And that led to a, uh, you know, a patent dispute over, you know, who, who owns this? Who, who, who's, whose patent is it? Who, who should get the uh, rights to it? And um, I think, you know, the, the bottom line is that this is going to continue to, you know, make lawyers rich over, <laughs> over a long period of time. Um, that's kind of what you're seeing going on right now. But, the, you know, for me as a scientist, the, you know, my, my, my fundamental interest in the end is I really want to see this technology deployed and, and used to solve real problems. And I think the good news is that patent fight is going on in the background. By the way, in other countries, uh, you know, the University of California is prevailing. So that's, you know, not true in the U.S. right now, but it's been true in China and in, in the U.K. and in, in, uh, um, and in Europe. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, meanwhile, scientists are continuing to use this technology in ways that I think are really promising. And companies are forging ahead, lots of money uh, flowing into companies as well. So uh, the patent fight goes on in the background, but science uh, proceeds as it should. All right, thank you. All right, we've had GMOs for food for a while. How does that differ from CRISPR? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's been lots of discussion about, about GMO. So GMO, GMO stands for Genetically Modified Organism. And it's come to be really have the connotation of something really evil and wrong, I think, you know, when we think about it applied to plants. And, and, uh, and why is that? And I think a lot of it goes back to the history of a company called Monsanto that, you know, was using uh, modifications of, of, of seeds to, you know, control access to those seeds by farmers. And I think a lot of people felt very resentful of that, rightfully so. And I think the other uh, fear about, you know, GMO, when you hear that label, you sort of think, ooh, that sounds like, you know, Franken food or something weird. You know, I don't want weird genes in my food. It sounds like creepy, uh, right? But, but the thing is, to, if you really think about it, um, the food that we eat today is, is, is highly modified. I mean, humans have been engineering food for, you know, millennia, really. And, and how do they do that? Well, you know, plant breeders have been selecting for, for traits in plants for a long time. And currently how that's done is, you know, you take seeds and you expose them to mutagens, whether it's, uh, you know, um, whether it's uh, radiation or chemicals, and you introduce lots of random changes to the DNA of those seeds, and then you grow them up into plants and you select for those, or you screen for those that have the properties that you want. And that's why it takes a long time. And also you have no idea what changes are coming along in the DNA that you might not want, but they're there because of the way that you generated the changes. And what I would argue is that, you know, this is a technology that allows very precise alterations to DNA at one place and not anywhere else. 
And so if we know about a gene that we want to either put into a plant or take out of a plant, if we have a tool like this, it's like a surgeon's scalpel. You, know, you go in and make a very precise change and you're not altering the DNA anywhere else. And I actually think that that's, to me, a more desirable way to make uh, changes to plants. And I also think we're gonna need this technology going forward because, you know, frankly, we're facing big challenges with climate change and, and pests. And I think, you know, here in Hawaii, we, we, we see lots of examples of this. So, um, you know, my, my position on that is that we should, you know, try to understand what, what GMO really means and, uh, and we should embrace the idea that we now have a technology that allows precise and accurate changes and, and nothing else. Jennifer, how effective do you see CRISPR being in combating treating cancer? Is it primarily dependent on the type or location of the cancer? So I think that, you know, for cancer, um, the CRISPR technology is going to do two things. One is it's going to allow us to understand better the genetics of cancer. And, you know, you probably know that's, it's a complicated disease. It's many diseases, really. And so to be able to really understand uh, what goes awry in cells that causes cancer is an important thing, and, and CRISPR can help us in, in, a, in a research capacity. As a therapy, I feel like the best application of this as a, as a cancer therapy is coupling it with something called immunotherapy, and you may have heard about this. It's a really, really exciting breakthrough in cancer uh, therapy over the last few years, but it's, right now it's really only working well for just a few kinds of cancers, like melanoma and uh, certain other you know, skin and blood cancers doesn't work very well for solid tumors. And the thinking is that if we can use gene editing to program the immune cells to target those uh, types of solid tumors, that we may actually be able to uh, goose up the immune system much more effectively than can be done currently. So that's what I think is a big opportunity in cancer therapy. This is a question that gets back to foods again. That's a really important topic here in Hawaii. The question is, why edit the genome of foods, what are the possible benefits and what are the risks to consuming the manipulated foods? Well, I think the benefits are that um, now that, you know, like that example I showed with the tomato, you know, it's now possible to make a precise change to the plant genome that will uh, introduce a desired trait without making a change to any of the other DNA. And it's a lot faster than doing it by traditional breeding. So it's not only more accurate, but it's a lot faster. And so why might we want to do that? Well, you know, there's lots of cases, and you know this very well, uh, you know, here in Hawaii, that, you know, you face situations where you've got plants that are highly inbred, and so they're very susceptible to disease. So imagine you could introduce a, a you know, a disease-resistant uh, gene into those plants. That would be potentially a very good thing to do. It avoids having to use chemicals, etc. Um, and also we can increase the nutrition of plants and we can uh, potentially introduce genes that allow drought resistance. So there's lots of things that I think could be done by this kind of manipulation that would be desirable. Um, what are the risks? Well, I think, you know, when you, uh, when you think about, you know, the, uh, when you think about introducing a foreign gene, especially into a plant, you have to do that in a thoughtful way. You don't want to do something that's going to be harmful to the environment. So I think there always has to be, it has to be a very clear pathway and process for doing that kind of work and ensuring that it's done uh, responsibly, accurately, and safely, and then tested to be sure that it's safe before it's released. Now, this question sounds like it comes from an attorney. <laughs> Who or how is CRISPR being regulated? Yeah, so, um, you know, how is it being regulated? Right now, uh, there's a set of guidelines that exist in the U.S., and they kind of guide what happens in the rest of the world as well, that were established back in the 1970s. So in the 1970s, when something called molecular cloning came along, there were some scientists at that time who recognized that, you know, it could be dangerous to put foreign genes into the kinds of bacteria that um, that, you know, that uh, uh, inhabit the human gut, for example. And so they met in Asilomar in California to discuss how that kind of technology should be regulated. It came to be known as the Asilomar meeting. And it had a big influence in the U.S. because it triggered um, regulatory agencies in Washington to establish guidelines that regulate how that kind of technology is deployed around, you know, certainly around the U.S. and with uh, taxpayer money, and that 
stimulated other countries to do similar things. So those guidelines turn out to be relevant here because they largely, you know, relate to what we're doing with genome editing as well. And they kind of, are, are, you know, people have looked at this and said, oh, good, we have a regulatory framework in place that works for genome editing. That being said, as I mentioned at the end, you know, there are certain applications like editing human embryos that, you know, is kind of really uh, something that, you know, we haven't had the capability of doing before. So suddenly we have this new capability, and that really does, I think, require you know, a careful assessment, and there will have to be regulatory guidelines that are still under examination right now. So this, this question sounds like a follow-up to that. Um, is there any way to control disreputable human engineering? Could this be the end of natural evolution, do you think? <laughs> Ooh, that sounds pretty freaky. Um, <laughs> Well, first of all, it's not going to the end of natural evolution, that's for sure, right? Because, uh, you know, think of all the natural evolution that's going on all the time, and, you know, humans, yeah, is, you know, we're, yeah, we're actively working in the lab, but we can't possibly keep up with what, what nature is doing. So it certainly won't be the end of it. But, um, but I think that, you know, there, there, is, there is real danger. And, you know, I met someone uh, earlier tonight uh, who's a, a professor here who's working on something called gene drives. And I didn't have a chance to mention it during the talk, but this is a way of using genome editing to introduce uh, traits into a population quickly. And this has uh, really attracted a lot of attention, especially for controlling mosquito populations, controlling the spread of disease by mosquitoes. I mean, these are, you know, things that are desirable for sure. But it, that uh, way of doing it has to be, you know, employed very carefully. So I think that, you know, there definitely are areas where gene editing is, you know, could be, could be dangerous. And so I think we do have to be um, examining those and really encouraging an open, transparent discussion and working with regulatory agencies to make sure we have the right guidelines in place. Jennifer, do you feel in any way responsible for the movie Rampage? <laughs> I claim no, no credit and no blame. <laughs> so in a word, no. <laughs> Okay, do you think CRISPR will or can be used for psychological mental disorders, also personality changes? Well, um, I think that's going to be really hard. And, you know, the reason is that, you know, I think, I think things that control our moods and depression and things like schizophrenia, you know, these are you know, incredibly important, uh, you know, sort of um, conditions in, in humans, and yet they're, they're mostly controlled by probably many, many genes that, that contribute. And so just understanding the complex genetics there is something that's still ongoing. And, you know, if you knew that there were a hundred or a thousand genes that were all involved in, in mood or depression, you know, it'd be really hard, I think, to use genome editing in this in this instance, because you'd have to make too many changes, and it would be very, certainly today, very technically hard. So I think it hold, you know, we're held back both by the technology, but really fundamentally by our lack of knowledge of the genetics of those kinds of, um, you know, situations. Okay. Do you, do you think there are going to be new organisms or genetic varieties uh, patented by commercial developers for profit, or will society benefit without being exploited in that way? Well, no, I think, I think there will be things that are patented for sure. But, you know, I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, I, again, I'm thinking about primarily in the agricultural sector, you know, uh, both animals and plants that are being engineered using this technology and related technologies that companies are developing and they want to commercialize. They want to sell them. And so, of course, they want to patent them because then they have protection and they can sell them without having competitors selling the same thing. So, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's coming for sure. Well, we have a whole bunch of questions, but I also know that we have to get you out by 820, Chancellor. So let me ask this last question, I guess. Um, when, when you look at the possibilities for cr the use of CRISPR, Cas9, or really any of these technologies, what are some of the things that you would like to see? What, what are some of the applications that you would like to see? And what are some applications that give you chills and make you 
have a hard time falling asleep at night? <laughs> and we'll, 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 end on, we'll end on that question. Well, the, the hard time falling asleep at night, um, you know, we, 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 we touched on a couple of them already, you know, sort of uh, people forging ahead to make CRISPR babies. That's, you know, that's a little creepy to me. And, um, and, and sort of the idea of gene drives, you know, dr you know, using sort of imagining traits that are spread through populations very quickly. And how would you, how would you control that environmentally? I think that's, that's something else that I worry about. But, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the thing that I worry about the most, and then I'll tell you what I'm really excited about. So the thing I worry about the most, honestly, is I, I actually, um, I think sometimes, you know, I've been in science a long time now, and I think sometimes, you know, scientists get, uh, really excited about a new technology and they race forward to use it um, and they want to, you know, I mean, we all want attention for our work, et cetera, and we want funding agencies to fund our work and things. So I worry that, you know, there could be a use of, of this technology that would, you know, attract attention, whether it's to, you know, you know, publish work on the first CRISPR baby or whether it's to race into a clinical trial before, you know, all the sort of ducks are in order to make sure that this technology is going to be safe um, that could uh, set the field back a long time. And this happened, you know, this happened uh, with, with something called gene therapy, um, you know, some, some, some 20 years ago when um, a guy named Jesse Gelsinger was unfortunately, uh, you know, was treated for leukemia using an earlier type of gene therapy that wasn't, wasn't really an accurate way of editing genomes, but, you know, involved inserting viruses into, into human DNA. And, you know, that triggered uh, cancer and that killed him. And so, you know, that really set the whole field of gene therapy back a long time. And I, I really would hate to see that happen here. So that's really what I would like to avoid. What I'm excited about is, you know, really the things that I think we've been discussing, you know, the possibilities of, you know, for me as a researcher, opening up, you know, new ways to study uh, all the fascinating biology and, you know, new questions out there. That's really exciting to me. I think, you know, I get emailed virtually every day uh, by people that have genetic disease in their families. And, you know, I get, I get pictures of people's children, their, their beautiful babies, and, you know, people who say, please help me, you know. And I, I just, um, my heart goes out to them. It really does. And I, I try to write back to every single person, you know, that writes to me. And I, you know, I think if someday this technology were used to cure genetic disease uh, like that, I would, I'd be overjoyed. So that's, that's my, my greatest hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Once again, on behalf of the University of Hawaii,